since we are not in the sanctuary, Sharon and Julaine are doing the bell and the chalice for us. And the words for our chalice lighting are from Mahatma Gandhi. Remember, Gandhi lived in a time of incredible political upheaval, a time of poverty, a time of illness, of instability. But he lived with integrity and hope and power. So hear these words that Gandhi spoke in that historical moment of difficulty, a message that we need to hear now. Gandhi says, there is a force in the universe, which if we permit it, will flow through us and produce miraculous results. There is a force in the universe which if we permit it to flow through us will produce miraculous results. I'm a little distracted because there's a spider sitting right above my computer on the eye where I look at you all. <laughs> so we have a spider present here who's witnessing our service. It's always great to have not just humans, but all of our animal and plant friends joining us. Come into this place of peace and let its silence heal your spirit. Come in to this place of memory and let our history, our stories, warm your soul. Come into this place of prophecy and power and let our collective vision change your heart. Welcome to our time of worship together. Now our opening song is number 12 in the hymnal and uh, Deb will put the, the words up into the order of, into the hat box and Julaine will lead us. Life that maketh all things new, the blooming earth our thoughts within, our pilgrim feet would with the dew in gladness hither turn again. From hand to hand, the greeting flows, from eye to eye, the signals run. From heart to heart, the bright hope glows, the seekers of the light are one. One in the freedom of the truth, one in the joy of God's untrod, one in the soul's perennial youth, one in the larger thought of God. The freer step, the fuller breath, the wide horizon's grander view, the sense of life that knows no death, the life that maketh all things new. I have a story for you this morning. Um, but before we do our story, it turns out there are at least four and who knows how many other birthdays of significance. We're, we're talking today about universalism. Our tradition, Unitarian Universalist, is, is the merger and pass of un Unitarianism and Universalism. And today we're, we're really focusing on Universalism because it's the 250th anniversary. And today is the birthday of Samuel Lewis who is the founder of the Dances of Universal Peace. You know, in better times, we host the dances in our sanctuary. And some of you, oh, there's the spider again. 
Some of you have um, attended and participated in this beautiful tradition of, of dancing the message, the, the words of the world's religions uh, and bringing the unity across all the different traditions. So today, happy birthday to Samuel Lewis and a few other folks. Um, Jeff, I believe it's your birthday today. A Facebook indicated, Jeff Tapdeck and uh, Laurel. I don't know if Laurel's here with us. Laurel's birthday and somebody else, right? Who's Who else's birthday is it? You're, you're muted. Ann Dempsey, happy birthday. Oh, Ann Dempsey, all right, excellent. So we've got all manner of birthdays. And uh, so so Julaine suggested we, we uh, do, do a little quick happy birthday. So let's do that. Go for it, Julaine, you're muted. And and do you how do you how unmute do you yourselves, everybody? We we rarely get to sing together, but Happy Birthday is one of those songs that it doesn't matter if it's completely chaotic. So <laughs> unmute yourselves so that we can hear so, you. So we're we're weaving a new vision with chaotic Happy Birthdays. Right. Right. And, and the happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday. And anybody else who had a birthday last week or next week or pretty soon or very recently. So happy birthday, everyone. And so my story for you this morning is from um, our heritage. So in the mid 1700s, in a town called Good Luck, New Jersey, there was a fellow named Thomas Potter. And he, he was not literate, but he was very curious about spiritual issues. He was, a, he was a businessman in his area. And what was being preached then was this, generally what was being preached, this sort of damnation that um, God has only a few people that God holds in favor and the rest of us, well, we're going to hell. And um, Thomas Potter was listening to that and saying, ah, really, really? I don't want that God, <laughs> a God who is so judgmental and unloving. And so Potter started hearing other preachers who were giving a different message saying, God is love, God is love. And so Potter started inviting anybody he could. And th so this message is called universalism with a small U as before there was a denomination. And so Potter would invite these people over to his house who would explore spiritual topics with him. And, and he couldn't read the Bible. So who would read the Bible and they'd argue about it. And after, after about, well, a few years, his wife was like, honey, that's enough. All these people <laughs> in and out of the house for, all the time, for goodness sakes, please just build a chapel or something and go over there and have all your talks and whatnot. And so he did, he built a chapel in uh, 1740 and he built it with the hope of a universalist minister preaching there and there, there were none to be found because it was a heresy it was it was just like how could you believe that this is the right way the right way to believe is that there's an elite that god loves and the rest of us well too bad for us but he, but thomas potter held out this hope so Meanwhile, over in England, in Ireland, in, in the area of Cork, Ireland, there was this young man whose name was John Murray. And he also was raised in a, in a kind of a judgmental tradition. And he was Church of England first, Anglican, and then he became a Methodist. And he started hearing the same message that God is love. God is love. There was a guy named uh, a Reverend Rayleigh over in England at the time was universalist preaching there. And so um, John Murray heard this and he's like, yes, yes, that makes sense. That my heart says yes to this judgmental thing. And so John Murray became a minister and he started preaching the gospel of love. He started preaching universalism and he got tossed out of the church for it, of course, because <laughs> that was not harmonious with the thoughts of the time. And at the same time, he it, he had a really a stretch of really bad luck of, of difficulties. His um, his his wife died, and his young son died. And he said, "I've had it. 
I'm out of here. And he left England, came to America. This was um, before the revolution. So, so America was still a colony in, in, uh, in 1770. And he, was, he said, I'm going to leave it all behind. I'm never going to preach universalism again. That whole mess of getting thrown out and tormented from, from my beliefs. I'm just going to go to America and start over. So he gets on a ship and he sails over to America. The, the ship is a brig. It's called the Hand to Hand. And um, they're, they, they're going up the coast. And when they get to, to the Americas, they're going up the coast. They were supposed to go to New York, but the winds weren't right. And they ended up in New Jersey. Well, they hit a sandbar and the, and the boat got stuck. And... Um, so what do you do when a boat is stuck on a sandbar? One thing you can do is you can offload some of the cargo. So they had a smaller boat and they offloaded things and the boat came up again. And what the captain of the boat put John Murray on the, the other boat, the cargo boat to sort of oversee it. Um, all, all the workers who were there with some of the provisions. Um, and so that did it. The boat rose, got off the sandbar, the big boat, the, the hand-to-hand, and it was able to get out into the main bay so it could it could proceed. Meanwhile, <laughs> the wind changed and everything, and the little boat that John Murray was on, that it was stuck. So there he is on this little boat, and he only brought with him his Bible and his wallet, his purse. Um, and so he lands. Uh, they, they decide to go to shore and look for, for, for position, provisions because the big boat the hand to hand, they went on to New York. They weren't going to sit around and wait for the winds to change so that the little boat could come out. They were going to come back later um, and see what they could do. So John Murray goes to shore and guess who he meets? The first person he meets is Thomas Potter. And this is 10 years after Thomas Potter built that chapel, built it for a, universal, a universalist minister to come and preach there. And when there were no universalist ministers to be found. So Thomas Potter had seen the whole drama of the boats caught out there and he went down and he greeted um, John Murray and said, I've been waiting for you a long time, a decade by then. And uh, he, he, they get to talking and he hears that indeed, John Murray is a universalist minister. And John Murray said, I have sworn it off. All it did was bring me grief. Uh, you know, I left England leaving all of that behind. I will not participate in this. And John Murray said, but I built a chapel. You have to stay till Sunday and preach. And John Murray's like, ah, what part of no, don't you understand? No, I gave it all up. I am not going to do this. And so, and, and uh, Thomas Potter, who built the chapel says, okay, if you're still stuck on Sunday, then you got to preach. And Thomas Potter said, and I know you will be, because I know. God wills this and wants this. And so come Sunday, John Murray's still stuck. And so he preaches. And so after waiting 10 years for a universalist minister to show up, the big day arrives that Sunday, September 30th, 1770, 250 years ago, the first universalist sermon was preached in America. And as Murray was preaching, the wind changed, and one of the guys who was on the boat came running up just as he was done preaching and said, okay, we got to go. The wind changed. We can get out of here. And John Murray leaves, and it made Potter's day, his life, and they were, they be, they were long, long-time friends for many years to come after that, and uh, after going um, back uh, up to New York, then uh, John Murray came back down and visited Thomas Potter and did some itinerant preaching around in that area. Eventually, uh, John Murray settled in Gloucester, Mass., which was the first Universalist church in America in, uh, in 1785, I believe. Our church was South, our, our Unitarian Universalist, we, Universalist Church of Springfield was um, founded in 1795. Some people say mm -hmm. our church is the fourth oldest universalist church in America. I haven't looked at the records exactly, but that's the folklore around it. So ours is one of the earliest. And so there we have a miracle story in the origins of our universalist tradition. What do you think of that? 
Are miracles possible? What's a miracle? What's this all about anyway? So let's just say the affirmation right now, um, the affirmation, I will put it in the order of service. This, this was written by a universalist from Barry, Vermont, L. Griswold Williams. So what's it all about? And, and this, this is such a beautiful piece. Love is the doctrine of this church. What's a doctrine? A doctrine is usually a very long, complicated argument. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, and it goes on and on and on. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a beautiful document. But Universal's cut right to the chase. What's our, docu what's our doctrine? One word, love, love, that's it. No arguments, no, well, if certain people do certain things, then they're beloved by God and they're the, no, love. So join me in the words to our affirmation, which are in the chat box. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell right. together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve the needs of all beings, oh, yes. to the end that all souls grow into harmony with the divine. Thus do we covenant with each other and with the source of our being. So we are universalists here. And what does that mean? In John Murray's time, it meant a different way than what was the norm then, the, the judgmental norm. And, and at, over these 250 years, universalism has, has evolved into something new, something beautiful, it's can, and it's alive. It's a tradition that is alive. So we're gonna, we're gonna um, do, a, uh, I, I wanna share with you this quote by Howard Thurman, because Howard Thurman, he, I'll talk about him in a little, in a few minutes. He's a universalist, he's a Christian, but he's a universalist in the sense that he gets it, that there's, there's, there's this one power, this one, one God, this one love. And we can see it, I'm wearing my stole, we can see it in all the world's traditions, but there's a oneness there. And so Howard, Howard Thurman says this, he, he's an, he's an African-American, he died like in 1981, I think, and he was a, a theologian, a professor at um, Boston University and Howard University. So Howard Thurman says this, there is something in every one of you that waits and, the, and listens for the sound of the genuine in yourself, there is something in every one of you that waits and listens for the sound of the genuine in yourself. You have this in you. It's the only true guide that you will ever have, says Howard Thurman. But you, can, but you need to hear it. He says, if you cannot hear it, you will spend your whole life on the string, on the ends of the strings that somebody else pulls. You have this inside of you, your genuine self, but you need to listen to hear it. And if you don't, you're just a puppet on somebody else's strings. This, this voice of love, this genuine voice of love that resides in every single human being, not just some, the old argument, there's an elect who are worthy of God. No, everybody has this, it's in all of us. So let us hear, let us sing, voice still and small, Julaine will play it for us, it's just beautiful short piece. And that will lead us into a meditation. Voice still and small, deep inside of, I hear you call singing. In dark and rain, sorrow and pain, still you singing coming my feet 
tears, quenching my tears. Oh, all the years they Boy, still I'm small, deep inside all. I hear you call, singing in dark and rain, sorrow and pain. Still you remain, singing, calming my fears, quenching my tears through all the years. So let us have a time of quiet meditation and prayer and touch that genuine place within us, in every single human being that Howard Thurman talks about. Your true, the truest guide you will ever have. So let's just listen to the silence within us. Thank you for sharing that silence. Join me now for a time of prayer. Spirit of life, the source, the one love. Thank you so much for the gift of this gorgeous October day. And thank you for the gift of this hour outside of the busyness of our lives where we can get quiet for a minute and listen to that still small voice within us. Thank you for the gift of this opportunity to connect with other people who can remind us of what is possible in the world, who can help bring us back to the truth within this power of love. Be with us. Thank you so much for all those who have gone before and held aloft a light of love this universal message that brings us hope in a broken world. Thank you so much for John Murray and Thomas Potter and John Riley and Augusta Chapin and Olympia Brown and Howard Thurman and F. Scott Peck and Edwin Markin. And thank you for all of the others who in throughout history, in times when humans were fighting with each other and saying, no, no, we're better. Those people, they're not worth it. All the people throughout time who, who have said, we are one humanity and everybody is beloved by God. Thank you for this beautiful, beautiful universalist stream of love and light and hope that we have the great, great blessing to live in. Thank you for these 250 years of love and give us the strength and clarity to move forward and carry out a message of love and hope into our broken and aching world that the next 250 years may be a blossoming of love and light that the message of universalism may quell the aching hearts of humanity and may help dawn a new era of love, justice, peace, and sustainability and help each one of us on this call 
listen to that voice within us and find our part, great God. Find our part in healing and bringing hope and love. May it be so. Blessed be. We are so fortunate that our beautiful virtual choir has produced this piece for us. And it, it's the spirit of universalism through the world's religion. It's really gorgeous. Thank you, Julaine, and all the rest of you on the choir who have added your voices to this. Thank you so much to all of our virtual choir and Julaine for leading on that. That's our vision. That's our hope. This universalist message. So I want to pick up where we left off last time. And, uh, you know, I meant to say at the beginning of the service, a few sort of housekeeping things. Um, Zuiko McCall, many of you know her. She's our neighbor in Springfield. She's uh, a monk at the Art Monastery, one of the founders of the Art Monastery. She was going to be preaching today. However, she's recovering from a sinus infection. So she wasn't up for it. So I'm here today instead. So Suwiko will be next week. Um, and just to make life a little bit more dramatic, I, I'm, I'm uh, preaching at 11 o'clock at another church on Zoom in New Hampshire. So <laughs> I'm going to have to leave at about five of, um, five of 11 in order to get over to New Hampshire. And um, so Sharon is going to do the, the final part of the service. So, um, so I'll disappear, but I'll be back at noon for our book group. So, so a few meetings ago, I raised this important question from Einstein. The most important question facing humanity, is the universe friendly or, or is it unfriendly? What's your relationship to the world? <clears throat> and so riffing on Einstein, what we talked about last time, the other most important question facing humanity, is the universe alive? Is it animate or inanimate? And I um, asked us to take on a challenge between now and Thanksgiving to walk in beauty. We sang that song last week. Now I walk in beauty. To walk in the world with the sense that it's alive. And to say thank you as you walk. Is the world alive? Is it friendly? So I've, I've been trying this week and I, I wanna invite you to do the same and see how it feels to you to, to walk in the world in this way. And so I wanna add to this another question. So oh, here's John Murray. There's the guy. And there he is preaching at Potter's Chapel. So there's my question I wanna to explore today. Are miracles possible? That's the story of John Murray. Showing up at Potter's Chapel when Potter had built the chapel 10 years before and was waiting for a universalist to show up and there were currently a universalist on the planet. And Murray got stuck there. When I first heard that story, it was told um, at a, at a, a Unitarian Universalist worship service by a, uh, a, a humanist who did not believe in miracles and told that story in a kind of a derisive way. Um, and I, I, wanna, I wanna entertain it in a completely different way. Are miracles possible? Back to those opening words by Gandhi. There is a force in the universe, which if we permit it, it flows through us and produces miracles, miraculous results. There is a Gandhi saying, there's a force of love. And if you work with it, you can work miracles in the world through you. It's, it's the love, you're allowing it to come through. Is this true or is it fantasy? That's the question. 
and it's very much connected to is the world alive as I'm going through the world am I just kind of trudging along doing my thing or am I in relationship with the people the beings the world around me and is there this source of love and light that come can come through me and interact in the world and produce well, messed up stuff, for sure. We've seen that happen, haven't we? But it can also produce beauty, can produce love, can produce harmony. I believe that is true. And this is the, this is, this is the meaning of universalism, that there is a love, a power. It's what turns the universe. It's not coercion. It's not force. Force only lasts as long as you're pushing. When you stop pushing, Things go back to their natural state. And what is their natural state? It is this burgeoning love, this love that Gandhi talks about. So in, a, in our heritage, universalism meant an argument kind of, a counterpoint to the prevailing theology of the day. And over the last 250 years, universalism has merged, has, has evolved into a wider sense of what is possible. A wider, a wider meaning. And I just find so much hope and inspiration from this. And I, I want to, um, there are so many people from all different religions, all different religions, what we just heard the choir sing about of the, the, the different, the different um, religions and the, 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 the commonality there. There are people who are giving this message that the foundation is love. There's like different flavors, different aspects, but all the same. And in, uh, in the 1980s, there was a uh, researcher, theologian, minister uh, named James Fowler. And he, he did research and he tried to understand people's spiritual development. And he came up with six different stages, you know, after interviewing a whole team of people who were working on this, you know, like a child's faith, a, 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 like a, a teenager faith, a young adult faith, different developmental stages. And the sixth one, the final one, the culmination one, he called it universalizing faith. And it's, it's a, a feeling of bringing the kingdom of God to earth would be one way to say it. And one of the exemplars of this universalizing faith that um, that Fowler gave when he when he developed this model was Gandhi. So and and we we heard those words from Gandhi as as the opening, as as the chalice lighting. So here's Gandhi, and there's those words. There is a force in the universe which, if we permit it, will flow through us and produce miraculous results. That force is love. And Gandhi says, and this is in the hymnal, this, this last page, if a single person achieves the highest kind of love, it will be sufficient to neutralize the hate of millions. One person who achieves this sixth state of universalizing love it can neutralize the hate of millions. This is not hyperbole. This, this is how the world works. So, so what do we have? Nine, eight billion people on the planet. So we don't need actually a lot of people to achieve this, 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 this state in order to cure the planet. Are you one of them? We need you. We need you. We just need ah, a few million people. I haven't done the math to self-actualize, to live this love day by day, and it will be sufficient to neutralize the hate of millions. Does that sound like nonsense? Some of the great universalists in our tradition, uh, Augusta Jane Chap Chapman is another one, a universalist minister. She helped create the Parliament of the World Religions back in the late 1890s in, in Chicago bringing, for the first time, bringing people from different little religions together. Hindu swamis, all kinds of folks, and looking for the commonality. She was a great leader in our tradition. And here's one of my heroes, Bede Griffiths. 
he was a Benedictine monk and he went to India. And in India, he read very deeply. This is, this is one, of, one of the books that I love. This is one of his books, One Light, One Light. Uh, it's kind of a culmination of, uh, of some of uh, excerpts from his writings. And what he, what he discovered when he read the Hindu scriptures and got really deep in it, it's like, this is the same teachings as Christianity. What? That's what he found. And he says, when the Jew, the Christian, the Muslim, and the Hindu, and the Buddhists open themselves in prayer and meditation to the transcendent mystery, going beyond the word, beyond thought, simply opening themselves to light, to truth, to reality, then that meeting takes place. This, that is what humani where humanity will be united. Only tr through transcendence will we find unity. And Bede Griffith uses that image that the religions, you know, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, all on the surface look so different. And people fight all on the surface. They make wars, they argue. But if you go deep into the center of any one of these, you come to the one light, truth, love. So we, there's the hope. And if a bunch of us come to that place, it neutralizes the fighting. There's so much hope and power in this. And here, here's one of my other heroes, Howard Thurman. The deeper down I go, the more into him I find myself. None of the categories of classification of faith, belief, etc. none of these classifications have any standing in the presence of this transcendent experience. Because I think that whether I am black, white, Presbyterian, Baptist, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, Muslim, in the presence of God, all these categories by which we relate to each other fade away and have no significance whatsoever. For in his presence, I am part of him being revealed to him. The words of power. Back to my initial question. Are miracles possible? I believe without a doubt that yes, they are, because I have witnessed them in my own life, in the life of people I love and serve, that when we come, when we meditate regularly, when we go out in nature, when we have spiritual practices that get us off the surface of argument, and for goodness sake, of course, we turn off the damn TVs and come deep into ourselves. As Howard Thurman says, you have it in you, the still small voice, listen. And when we touch that and we go back out into the world and come from that place of unity, we're different. And we interact differently. We interact with love, with kindness. Situations that are challenging or difficult or contentious, our calm presence brings the possibility of unity there. There is this wonderful little piece by Edwin Markham, who was a universalist um, back in the 1800s. He says, he drew a circle that shut me out. Heretic rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. Isn't that great? I'll read it again. I'll say it again. He drew a circle that shut me out. Heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. So whoever is creating a contentiousness of, no, those people are not good enough. Those people are wrong. Those people are not loved by God. There's only a select, only an elite who matter. Love and I have the wit to win and say, no, actually, Draw the circle wider. Draw the circle wider. Let love guide us. Not contentiousness, not elitism, not fighting. That love, which every single human being has dwelling in the depth of their own heart. So how about you? What do you think? Are miracles possible? Have you listened 
to that still small voice inside of you? Do you know that you are a vehicle of light and love? That is, you can, you can help heal the world. You look around, it's so contentious, it can seem hopeless. It is not, it is not, dear ones, it is not. We are so powerful. When we're on the surface arguing, we have no power. But when we go into that depth of our being, we have the mightiest power, the only power that there really is. And from this power, as Gandhi says, when we enter, when we interact in the world, let this power flow through us, we will see miraculous results. How about you? The world needs you. We only need a few good million, that's all, to change the fate of our planet. Are you in? You signing up? We need you. I'm gonna go back to my questions. Is it, did it come on screen? So back to Einstein. Is the, is, he, is the universe alive? Are you walking on the earth as though it's alive? Are you coming from that place of love and kindness in your heart and creating more love each step of your way? So I challenge you between now and Thanksgiving, walk in beauty. Walk as though you, the universe were alive. Walk as though you are bringing the kingdom of love onto the earth. Walk as though you believe that miracles are possible because they are, but they're only possible if you get out of the way and let them come through you. They're only possible if you believe it because otherwise you're just trudging through paradise, going on through, doing who knows what, squandering your one wild and precious life. So let us wake up, brothers and sisters. Let us wake up. So between now and Thanksgiving, let's do it. Let's walk as though the world is alive. Walk as though we believe in miracles. Walk as though we are ready for love to come through us and create miraculous results in, in our home, in our family, in our workplace, in our county, in our country, in the world, in the universe. We need you. We need everyone. So hear these words again from Gandhi. There is a force in the universe, which if we permit it, will flow through us and produce mir miraculous results. If a single person achieves that highest kind of love, it will be sufficient to neutralize the hate of millions. May the next 250 years of universalism on this planet be a time of peace, of beauty, of harmony, of sustainability, of friendship and of love. May it be so. And may you be a crucial part of it. Amen. Gotta go to New Hampshire. Love you all. I'll be back just after noon and Sharon will Sharon will steer the boat. Thank you, Sharon. Lots of love, everyone. And a reminder that we will see Mellon again uh, around noon for those of us who gather to discuss the book, My Grandmother's Hands. So she's got three Zooms in a row. <laughs> we have and, one final uh, song to sing together, um, okay. which is After Love Will Guide Us. Candle and, and Bell. Right. But we, here's our last song. I think Deb probably has the words up for us. Love will guide us. Love will guide us. Peace has tried us. Hope inside us. Will we go on the road from grief to giving? Love will guide us through the hard night. If you cannot sing like angels, if you cannot.
Julaine will extinguish her candle.